One week, less than one week away from the NBA draft lottery. What are the Pacers options going to be if they move up to one, two, three, or four, even if they end up where they are right now? We'll get to all of them today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers. As always, my name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI. And today, the draft lottery, less than a week away, it is rapidly approaching. Huge day for the Pacers offseason will define so much of what they do. I want to talk about what the ripple effects could be of where the Pacers end up their own slot. So seven, eight, nine, whatever versus the top four is very different. We're going to focus on the actual move up scenarios today. to kind of get prepped for this week, there'll be more draft stuff coming in the coming week Uh, next Monday, talking Brandon Miller talk lottery preview next Tuesday. It's all going to be fun, but I want to look at kind of the options of this top group between picking trading out, trading around, and I have a big takeaway about trading from the top four, even the top 10, that I think is worth knowing for fans with the lottery coming up. But the place to start with this draft is always how talented it is, somewhat skewed by the top end, top, top, top dog, Victor Wembanyama being so unbelievably good, but the top end is still good outside of him. And so, Yes, this is a good draft, I think, down through even, you know, eight, nine-ish, depending on who you have where. I'm falling in love with a guy that is not very commonly promoted in the Pacers sphere, but, you know, we'll see where this ends up. But it looks like a solid draft. Like, you're getting a top, usually a fourth, fifth best player kind of guy in the eight, nine range. That's great. But the top, the lottery, the picks the teams would like to jump up to is stacked. It's really, really good. Brandon Miller would be number one picks in some drafts. Scoot Henderson would be number one picks in in many, not all, maybe like half drafts, I would say. One Banyan would be first in all of them. So that is, of course, a factor in this. And so when you look at the top four, a reminder, the Pacers' chances of actually jumping into that range is a little under 30%. All right, a little under one in three chance the Pacers end up with a top four pick. The option at one is easy. And we'll talk about trades in the final two segments. But if the Pacers jump up to one, you can skip the last 25 minutes of the show, right? You pick Wemby. And, and to me, you know, you can think about what the contingency plans are at two and three and four. And if you get one, I'll probably do a show on it if it happens. But if you get one, you have the conversation, right? You sit down. If you're any team, Pacers included, and you go, what would we actually trade this for, right? And in the NBA, to me, that list is like Jokic, Luka, uh, Embiid, maybe, I mean, uh, Giannis, maybe, I mean, his contract is short. Like it is, it is the creme de la creme is what you would trade it for. And if you're the Pacers specifically who have a 23 year old best player and a timeline that also features a 20 year old first team, all rookie player, you might not trade it for anything unless it's a star under contract for several years. Like the Pacers list might just be. Luka Doncic and maybe Jokic, right? Because of their situation. And so they might not trade it for anything at all. So looking at the the plans and what this draft could look like for the Pacers, moving up to one, that could just be it. The rest of their offseason is when Banyama is going to be a Pacer, now what? What are the other things that now have to happen? But two, three, and four are where I think this gets a little interesting and where the Pacers have to think about what the rest of the situation is. Two is fascinating because of the decision at hand. If the Pacers think Brandon Miller is better than Scoot Henderson or maybe someone else is in this tier completely for them, right? The whisper of the Thompson twins. I think there was a report about the San Antonio Spurs potentially valuing Eamon Thompson over some of these Henderson Miller types. But if going on the consensus, the commonly reported top three, if the Pacers get two and it's Henderson versus Brandon Miller, Do they think Henderson's good enough to pick instead of the forward or do they pick Miller? And if they like Miller better, but they know a different team like Scoot Henderson better, that isn't picking three. 
do they trade back a little bit? Do they try to find a way to get the best of both worlds, get their, get their guy and something else, you know, for example, we'll talk about this trade in a future segment too, but the Celtics Sixers trade of the 2017 draft Fultz for Tatum and the Kings unprotected 2019 first round pick. That was supposed to be a very good pick ended up being 14 and being Romeo Lankford fittingly for, for people listening in Indiana. But like that was kind of not a challenge trade, but just like, we love this guy. We're willing to move back and get other stuff along the way. That kind of thing, right? Do the Pacers say, you know what? If this team loves Scoot, let's extract assets from them. Or do they just pick Brandon Miller? Do they think he's a perfect fit? Or do they pick someone else completely? That's part of it. But if they're three and they're at the back of this two, they're at the mercy of what happens at two, right? That also changes what this looks like. Do they value best player available and just pick Henderson in that case? Do they trade back out of that completely? Because you can't even talk about trading up. One is not available. One Banyama is not available if you end up with two or three. And so two and three is a unique tier because, look, it's early to say, like I'm talking about Miller and Henderson as if it's fait accompli. They'll go two, three, as has been talked about for forever and ever. Perhaps someone else could sneak in here. But just given the conversation so far and kind of how how I view things and how it's been kind of discussed, I would say it's those two guys. If you end up at two, if you're the Pacers, I think your options are you have a lot of options, right? You have the do we like Scoot the most? And if so, should we pick him? If they value Henderson and Miller equally, do they just pick Miller and deal with it? Or do they try to find a way to do the best of both worlds thing and move back and still get Miller and get the most possible stuff out of that spot? If there are three, they don't have that luxury and they might just pick best player available. And that's why I think a key part of this draft for the Pacers, especially if they move up in the lottery, is going to be about tiers, right? Do they view someone as in the same tier? as Henderson and Miller? Do they even view those two players as in the same tier? How big is the gap between that group and the next group? Because if you get three and you have player two and player three in the same tier, great, it's easy. You pick whoever's still there. If you have a drop-off there or if your drop-off from three to four is huge, all of a sudden the contingency plans are significant. And so it could shake out great. The Pacers could end up three and the top two teams are a, an obvious Wimbanyama team and an obvious Scoot Henderson team, like the Spurs, for example, seem like they should be a Scoot Henderson team. You know, the Magic, for example, seem like they should be a Scoot Henderson team, right? Something like that. It, it, it's easy to pick teams and say what could happen. So if maybe it works out, but if it doesn't, what can they move around and do? We'll talk about moving around in the first round in a later segment. Now, four, moving up to four is really fascinating because, of course, if you're any team in the league and you jump up in this draft, you go, yes, we moved up. We have more options. Even if you don't like a Thompson twin for whatever reason or another, or you don't like whoever is considered to be the fourth best prospect at that time, you know, Whitmore, Walker, Black, whoever at the time of the draft, it, you're up at four. So someone else could like that. It's still better to move up. But that's where I think the tiering part really matters because the Pacers – don't view forwards as valuable as two and three. Maybe they can move around from four. But if the tier is from five, player four to player eight or nine or whatever, maybe you're more willing to move back. There's not as much separation, at least commonly discussed around the league, from that spot to a little bit later in the first round. So where the Pacers land, of course, is relevant. But moving up to very every single slot kind of changes what you can do. You know, it's not like past years of the draft where you know if you get anything from one to four you're thrilled and you could move up to one or you could slide around in the first round and get your guy no this year it's like you your total options and your strategy totally changes based on where you land and if you're one you don't even think about what moving looks like and if you're two and three, you think about what moving in one tier looks like. And if you're four, you think about it getting assets from a desperate team who wants a specific guy. So the strategy completely changes. And that's why I want to talk about two different strategies the Pacers would, could think about beyond just picking their favorite player. And that's trading around in the first round and trading out entirely of the first round. We'll look at some past precedent to see what that could look like if such a situation arises. Before we do that, though, got to talk to you guys. About the game time app, best way to buy tickets these days is with 
the Game Time app because it's the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. They've got killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee. So no more stressing over tickets. They've got flash deals and last-minute tickets. It's easy to find and buy them for every event in your area. Images of your seat view on the app and the lowest price guarantee, event cancellation protection, and job loss protection. So forget planning months in advance. Get images of your seat before you buy. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Two taps in your set, and they're sent directly to your phone so you don't have to dig through your email. And the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. So download the game time app, create an account, use the code Lockdown NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. But again, that create an account, redeem the code Lockdown NBA for $20 off at game time. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thank you, as always, for making Lockdown Pacers your first listen today. And every single day for your second listen, I'll say either of the teams that won their game five last night. This is the absolute best NBA playoffs. This has been such a good year for the postseason. But the top two in the MVP race both get it done in game five on Tuesday. Locked on Sixers for the 76ers take. Man, am I hyped for that team being up 3-2 or locked on Nuggets for the Denver take. Also hyped for that team being up 3-2. Jokic has been awesome. What a great playoffs. Um, Let's talk about... More about the Pacers and draft scenarios from the lottery specifically. Those picks are going to have a lot of value. It's a good draft, right? They're going to have a lot of value in potential trades as they do. And I want to start with trading out of the first round completely. And I don't mean all three Pacers picks, although it's possible, but I mean trading out of a lottery pick. And I start this exercise by saying, you know, you think about it for the Pacers, like they want to be good next year. They've talked about it. Tyrese Halberton said, you know, Playoffs is on the mind. TJ McConnell mentioned it. Kevin Pritchard mentioned 45, 50 wins. Rick Carlisle said their team's going to look different next year. Like th- they want to be good. They Kevin Pritchard no- t- noted that timeline acceleration is something they ha- they're probably going to do, quite frankly, given their assets and given how good Halliburton is right now. Right. That is a team. This is a team, the Pacers, that wants to be good next year. And so the option of trading four for a, a mega talent that helps you do that right now, or three or two or one, wherever they end up, you have to think about it you have, if you're the Pacers. And if that means trading that player for a star or a really good player under contract for a long time, the MO of Kevin Pritchard for his time here, you have to consider it or you have to think about it. And so trading out is one factor with just that pick. Reminder, I'm not talking about trading out of the first round entirely because the Pacers also have 26 and 29, which by the way, could be a factor in their thinking here because let's say they end up with the, this is a rosy way of of discussing it. Let's say they end up with 32 as well from the Rockets and they can trade 26, 29 and 32 for 19, 18, something like that. They might be more comfier trading out of one, two, three or four, although not one with two, three or four. If they know they're also going to get a pretty good player on their young timeline as well. So that might make things easier. That said, let's talk about the historical precedent of trading out, out. It's very rare that a team with a, even a top 10 pick, not even a lot, like a jump up in the lottery height of pick, even a team with a top 10 pick trades it and doesn't get any compensation in that draft back, right? For example, and we'll talk about a ton of trades that have happened in the top 10 in recent years in the next segment, but it like even the Jimmy Butler trade, a super duper star, Jimmy Butler. I mean, he's still tearing it up right now. The Jimmy Butler trade to the Timberwolves. This is a long time ago. Jimmy Butler went to Minnesota. The seventh pick, which was Markinen, Zach Levine, uh, who was uh, three years removed from being the 13th pick and just averaged 19 points per game. Looks like a stud. Went to the Bulls. So did Chris Dunn, who was the fifth pick the year before. That's a lot of stuff. But Jimmy Butler wasn't the only thing that went to Minnesota. They also got the 16th pick. They did a terrible job. I think they picked Justin Patton with the pick. But like even a trade like that, where the Wolves were trading for a superstar player, they gave up seven and still got 16 back, right? Like it's super rare that a team with a top 10 pick trades it and does not get anything back in that draft. The two examples from the last decade or so, a little over that, are the Kevin Love trade to the Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, which that one was funky because after Wiggins signed his rookie deal, they had to wait 30 days. But either way, that was Wiggins who went one, Anthony Bennett and Thad Young. It was like a multi-team trade. The Sixers were involved for Kevin Love, 
right? The Cavs did not get a pick from that draft in that trade. Kevin Love, superstar at the time, was only 25 years old. The other example from the last decade of this, another 25-year-old stud big man who can play the the four and the five, Anthony Davis, right? That was pick four, Lonzo, Ingram, Hart, and the other, the rest of the treasure trove of picks, right? So it's only happened twi- like twice where they trade completely out of that draft. And the Pelicans end up trading that fourth pick. And we'll talk about that trade in a minute, actually. But it's exceedingly rare. It's only happened twice for 25-year-old stud talent kind of guys. So maybe one of those is available, right? Perhaps one of those becomes available and the Pacers could get them. But that is the level of player would take. Like, like Ananobi or Bridges are these like reported names that teams have pursued. I'm not saying the Pacers have or haven't. But, you know, there was some reporting about the Grizzlies potentially doing it right. Like, even they seem like guys that if you trade 4 3 2 for them, you'd get something else back from the team besides just the stud player. Like, the level of player it, it, it's taken to trade out of the top 10 is like a, a super duper mega star. The Pacers are in a position where it makes some sense to trade out. I don't know if they should. I would not personally myself trade out, but, but if you're a really young team, they have three very obvious core guys who are 24 and younger in Nembard, Matherin, and Halliburton. They have five picks this year. If they trade this one, it's down to four, whatever. They have a ton of space to add guys that of course be adding whoever they get from this trade because they have a lot of flexibility because they're right now a very cheap team and could be cheap for a decent amount of time, depending on who they get in this trade. They are uniquely positioned to be able to do it and not be committing to one sort of team or structure or style. Now you're obviously committing to Halliburton plus whatever star you get, but it's not like you can't shake up the team in other ways in the future. And in that way, I think the Pacers are kind of uniquely positioned to trade out, right? They're they're good-ish. They're not good, but they're good-ish. They have a lot of cheap talent and they have clear needs positionally, right? It does make sense. Again, I, to be clear, would not do this <laughs> unless I'm getting another pick back. But, you know, if you can pick someone you love at 26 or something, maybe, you know, it, maybe there is a way that this makes sense. So the precedent is there for a trade out, but I don't think the Pacers would do that given what their current kind of timeline looks like it is right. Like I just said, three of their core guys are 24 and younger. Like Tyrese Halbert might just be your timeline. If you can add a guy to that and Matherin who's around that age, you probably feel pretty good about it, but I understand. Like, I don't know. I'm not even sure who the player would be that makes sense or it it could be available. And I don't like guessing and just being like this guy, you know, um, like a bam out of bio. I mean, maybe that's not even high enough. Level of talent again, the Heat have no reason to trade him. That's why I hate just naming names. Um, but that kind of level, Jalen Brown, maybe like that kind of level of talents would be trade out level. But it, it's interesting that the Pacers are in a position where it would make some sense if they get two, three, or four to do something like that. But it's again exceedingly rare that that happens without also getting more back because generally a team that has a pick like that, you know, is, is in the top four was bad. Right, they weren't good, <laughs> so they they aren't ready to just go all in and splurge. They need more young stuff along the way, and the Pacers are certainly in that group. They're not bad, right? They they are unique. This is also a unique situation for the Pacers in that thirty five wins was the seventh worst record. Like a lot of times, that's you know a fringe, you know twelfth pick, right? This year, a lot of teams were good, so there are a lot of factors at play here between the quality of this draft and what the Pacers' other draft picks are and their cap space and stuff like that. But trading out, I I suppose, makes some sense given their situation. But historically, it's super, super, super rare. It's also only happened to teams that uh, have LeBron James. (laughs) Fittingly enough, the only teams that have done it for like the last 10 years, like it's just not a common thing. So it might sound appealing to go, let's trade two, three, or four for a super duper megastar, but it doesn't seem like something that will happen given the history. What does make sense if the Pacers are inclined to trade or try to maximize their assets or get something else is moving around in the first round, going somewhere else to extract something or something like that, doing a package, trading up. Let's talk about those options to close out today's show. Thank you as always 
for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Check out the loser side of Tuesday's playoff games. Locked On Celtics with John Corrales to hear about the Celtics on the brink. What's going on? They looked horrible in this game. Or Locked On Suns with Brendan Clean to hear about whew, the Suns down 3-2. to two. It's going all in. Tough in the first year. Suns still set up pretty well. But Brendan Clean will have more for you at Locked On Suns. To close out with the Pacers, and trading around in the first round. I don't want it to seem like I'm ignoring like a like a trade for like a Mikael Bridges level player. Like that still is something that makes sense for the Pacers. There's just infinite number of possibilities of good players worth trading for. I'm not going to do fake trades like that. I just want to talk about the movement of the Pacers on the in the draft or with their assets if they move up in the lottery. And of course, trading it for a good player makes sense. It's just very rare to see a team trade out completely but trading for another player moving around in the first round that happens all the time all the time so of course that could be option one i'm not going to sit here and name every player who could feasibly be available that would fit with the pacers need you've seen a lot of them reported already there could be more depending on who loses when in the playoffs or what team decides to change directions or an ownership change or a million factors could be at play but if the pacers get four and you know, a good young player becomes available. Yeah, they'll think about it. But in terms of actual options that open up, you know, extracting assets from another team by trading four for, I don't know, nine and 20 or something is not something that's available if you don't have pick four, right? So moving around in the first round is something that is specific to moving up in the lottery and isn't just guessing potentially available players. And that is what I want to kind of own in on here as some of the options looking back through history, right? Even if four, if four seems like the most likely, like think about trading it pick just because of the way the tiers work in this draft. But even if the Pacers are at third and the first two are Wembenyama and Miller, let's say they don't love the Scoot Henderson fit, maybe three. And that could be a very premium pick if Scoot Henderson's still available. You know, there's a lot of ways to think about that. And this seems like something that would be plausible for the Pacers to consider. And there's, again, a million trade permutations that are out there, right? I don't want to just throw stuff at the wall, but I do want to look at history and see what's available. And this is what's happened a lot more, right? Like I said, with trading out, super rare team trades a top even 5, 10 pick and gets not another first in the same draft back. So looking at a very recent trade with the fourth pick, right? Funnily enough, the Pelicans got the fourth pick in the Anthony Davis trade, They traded that fourth pick. They traded four that year, which was DeAndre Hunter, plus some crappy salary, Solomon Hill, former Pacer, uh, a future second rounder, and the 57th pick. So put those as just like very small assets. They basically traded four and crappy salary. They got back the eighth pick, the 17th pick, and the 35th pick. So one thing that that clicked in my head just then is seeing 8, 17, 35 was, oh, (laughs) the Pacers could put together a similar package to that if they want to move up to four from eight or nine, if that's where they land. But also, you know, that's sort of the value that could make sense for the Pacers, but they obviously don't want three picks, right? So if the Pacers have four, for example, could they get eight and then a a good forward who has about the 17th pick level value? You know, who, who is that? I, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to just guess, players i'm trying to think of someone like kelly Ubre, i guess is someone who i would call about that value maybe that's not even high enough i don't know but something like that and then a good second you know does that make sense right that's what the pick the fourth pick has been in the most recent history the sixth pick in that exact same draft 2019 was a weird trade draft it ended up being Jarrett culver he got traded uh to minnesota for the 11th pick which was cam johnson and Dario Saric, who was uh, three years into his rookie deal, he was a former lotto pick, and he was good, right? That's six. That's not a lottery pick. But still, you get a later lottery pick and a good player at a good position, right? So that is something – that is like – the reason I bring that up is that is maybe something the Pacers would think about. Can they trade four for six and good young forward who isn't like amazing but is still valuable, right? That seems like – kind of their MO of trades is something similar to that structure, right? There was the Luca trade. That one's weird because Luca was like a pretty dang good historical prospect, but Luca was the third pick. He got traded for the fifth pick and then 10th pick the following year. 
Um, that is also something that would make sense for the Pacers in this draft if they love a Thompson twin and Scoot Henderson doesn't fit them, right? Trades. These are all hypotheticals, but trading Scoot for a Thompson twin and X a lottery pick the next year or a, a player worth about lottery pick value. Does that make sense, right? That is one that, that I thought made sense. The funny one I talked about already was the Tatum Fultz one, obviously with one Banyama off the table, but like, let's say the Pacers are fourth and a team that loves Amen Thompson is at two. Can the Pacers do Thompson plus, you know, another one of their own picks for Miller or something like that? You know, there's a lot of a lot of these historically that are kind of funny, right? The Marquise Chris trade. He was the eighth pick his year for Bogdan Bogdanovich, 13 and 28. So that's basically three firsts for eight. But hey, the Pacers have three firsts. Like there's a lot of historical stuff that says they could be moving around the first round pretty easily with the stuff they have. But looking at the value of what you can kind of get for two, three, four in drafts that aren't as good as this one, the the, the Tatum Fultz draft was thought of kind of highly, which it didn't turn out to be. But um, I remember at the time, but in general, this one being better, you can probably get even more value for this stuff. But again, th that is, I hope the takeaway there was a couple things. One, the Pacers, they see a lot of picks moved in these trades. They're not going to want a lot of picks. So maybe they trade to go back to the, the fourth pick trade, the DeAndre Hunter trade. So the Pacers get four, right? They're not going to take back three firsts for four because then they'd have seven picks. Like they can't make seven picks, obviously. So could they do four for eight plus an actual player who has about the value of the 17th pick and a player who has about the value of the 35th pick, right? That is what they would be thinking in their situation, right? So that makes a little more sense for them as a concept, but also makes sense for them to me from a team building perspective. If they want better players to be that 45, 50 win team, they need established talents, right? They don't need more assets, and so when you look at moving around in the first round, if they jump up to two, three, or four, that's the kind of one to own in on. Or the Culver trade at six, where again, uh, the Phoenix Suns in trading with Jared Culver got the Cam Johnson pick and Dario Saric, who again, his career's kind of changed from his rep at the time. But that value also, or structure and idea also makes sense for the Pacers, who their trade partner could be depends on where they land, what that team's stuff is. But the, those, these kind of trades that I've been talking about for most of this segment, this is what makes the most sense to me as something the Pacers could do if they jump up, right? Perhaps they just love the top four. And then the last 20 minutes of what I've said means nothing. They will pick at that slot and they'll be thrilled that their core of Halliburton, Mather and Nembard and lottery pick like good lottery pick, top four pick, is set. That's a great place to start. That's an amazing place to start. But perhaps they go, well, we can get Halliburton, Matherin, Nembard, and I'm just going to pick a player from a mock draft. I mean, again, I don't, you know, Matherin, Halliburton, Nembard, Cam Whitmore, and a insert X already good 26-year-old NBA player. Maybe that's more appealing to them. Right. But moving around the first round, I think, is something they will definitely consider given their situation of wanting talent now, not having a lot of roster spots and needing to think about future assets. Perhaps something else that makes sense, too, is um, the future pick part of the DeAndre Hunter trade was certainly a factor there. And that was part of the Luca trade, right? Luca for Trey Young plus that 10th or the 10th pick the following year, right? with the Pacers roster spot situation picks in future years could mean more to them than picks this year, right? That's something else to consider. So to sum up what we've talked about today, if the Pacers move up in the lottery, they could do anything. Duh. But I would say history tells us and the Pacers situation and timeline tells us that trading out for a super duper mega star, exceedingly unlikely, not looking like something that teams do that don't have LeBron James in their team, that teams do that aren't quite ready to compete. Instead, what history tells us and what logic tells us and what the Pacer situation tells us is that they'll either pick someone they think is awesome or they'll move around in the first round to get a player they think is awesome and extract value for their pick. The Pacers have moved around quite a bit in recent drafts, right? Especially in the back of the, of the first round kind of. 
maybe that's what they look more to do. But given their situation, I think anything's going to be on the table. I think this draft lottery and the league landscape will be very telling for the Pacers' future situation. And once it's over next week, we'll break down everything about what happened and what the Pacers can do instead. Now that I'm this far, and I guess we'll say I'll be at the draft combine, not the lottery itself, but the combine in Chicago. So hopefully I can glean some things to say and learn some stuff about these prospects and what they could potentially be one day or gather some rankings and figure out who is liked and not liked around the league to talk more about this stuff once the lottery is over and really dive into the prospects tomorrow for you everydayers uh, locked on Pacers. Caitlin and I's last episode together, breaking down the 2022, 23 seasons for Rick Carlisle and Kevin Pritchard. We've already done all the players, but we want to do the decision makers, the coach, the, the president to round out that series Friday. Uh, talking about free agency previews for James Johnson and George Hill, plus the new Mad Ants news, as well as the all-rookie teams. And then next week's going to be a draft-heavy week before we blend free agency and draft talk for the rest of the summer. So you team-building people will love what's coming uh, starting really next week and the week after. And the lottery is going to dictate a lot of it. Hope you guys enjoyed today's show. If I left out anything or you have any comments or concerns, I'm on Twitter at Tony R. East. Or if you're watching on YouTube, just comment there. I read all of those, no matter how. Uh, some t- how much sometimes I think they're not my favorite. Um, either way, thank you all for listening and commenting and chatting with me. Hope you all had a great day. We'll see you soon.